Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to another episode of What's Up Doc. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Barwani, and I'm a board certified family physician. My show, What's Up Doc, is a production of Muslim Network TV, the only network broadcasting in North America that focuses on Muslims. You can find us streaming almost every day on our YouTube page at youtube.com forward slash Muslim Network TV and on our website at muslimnetwork.tv. We're also available on Roku, Galaxy 19 Satellite, Fire TV, and Apple TV. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. It's a very famous quote that's often attributed to Hippocrates. Yet a lot of us don't really understand what that means or how important eating healthy is on our health, mental health, as well as our well being. That's the topic of today's episode. And joining us in that episode is Nur Zibde. Nur Zibde is a functional and an integrative dietitian and nutritionist. She specializes in nutrition therapies for digestive conditions like acid reflux, irritable bowel syndrome, and inflammatory bowel disease, as well as conditions that can stem from underlying gut imbalances, including thyroid problems, autoimmune diseases, food sensitivities, chronic fatigue, migraines, and headaches, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, and skin issues. Nur is the author of the Complete Acid Reflux Diet Plan, Easy Meal Plans and Recipes to Heal GERD and LPR, and Detox Way, Everyday Recipes to Feel Energized, Focused, and Physically and Mentally Empowered. Welcome to our show, Nur. It's such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I mean, you are such an expert in your field, and the fact that you've, you've written two books on the topic, including Acid Reflux, which we've actually talked about on this show before, is amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know you guys talked about it at a previous episode with Dr. Otaki, and so it was really nice to hear like the medical the diagnosis and the medical management and treatment. And so uh, my book, if for those who watched it, really go deep into the diet. And one thing he said that resonates with me is that the diet has to be individualized. It's not uh, one diet that's going to fit everyone. There are some common triggers, things like citrus foods and spicy foods and mm -hmm. um, maybe um, like tomatoes and things like that. But a lot of times people avoid these common triggers and they still have symptoms. And so we really have to dig deeper and look at individualized uh, sensitivities and intolerances. And also at the same time, not everybody reacts to everything. And so some people may be giving up certain foods because they hear or they read that they trigger acid reflux, but uh, they may not for them. So in the book, I walk through people a general approach where I tell, you know, share what's the, what are the foods to eliminate? It's an elimination plan. And I know that can be scary for some people, but for people who are dealing with digestive issues and on daily basis, um, it's, it's painful, it's uncomfortable. And so these elimination plans are going to be really helpful to identify the triggers. And then the goal or the ultimate uh, end result is to be able to bring some of these foods back. And I also talk about the things that would create more pressure in the abdomen. And so with people with reflux, it's mostly about the acid coming up into the esophagus, creating that uh, burning sensation. So how do we identify these foods that cause the gas and, uh, and the bloat in the abdominal area? And so uh, I highly recommend if people watch that episode, they are dealing with acid reflux or LPR, where the acid can cause cough and uh, soreness in the throat, to check out the book. It's a really simple read with recipes, of course. That's awesome. How, I mean, you're just giving, like you said, it's a complete guide. You're helping walk through what are the things that are commonly seen. Elim so, and you said elimination diet. And for those who may not know, that's where you kind of remove a lot of common triggers and known um, irritants and then slowly reintroduce. Is that correct? Absolutely. So there are different ways to do elimination diets and, um, you know, some some plans may suggest that you eat four to ten foods. It's, it's going to really depend on the person and the sensitivities or the symptoms that they're dealing with, their medical condition. I do food sensitivity testing. So on top of the general diets or the things that we know can certain 
can trigger certain conditions or certain symptoms, I may layer that when I'm working with my patients. But the book is obviously like meant for everyone with acid reflux or LPR to use it. And to at least if it doesn't resolve 100%, which it can, and a lot of people that I don't know have messaged me on social media and thanked me for it. So it's really, alhamdulillah, very rewarding to get those messages. But that's absolutely the first step. And elimination sounds like you're pretty much eliminating possible triggers. Mm -hmm. And um, it can be a little intimidating for people because we like food. Food is fun. Food is part of our culture. We celebrate with food. But really, I always tell people it's it's a sh should be. Any elimination should be for a short period of time until you find your triggers and then uh, help calm the digestive system and any other systems associated. Uh, maybe like uh, it's triggering uh, some hormonal issues or immune issues. And then look at what's really causing those uh, imbalances or lack of ability to tolerate these foods. And after you you take the right nutrients and follow the right plan, your body should be able to tolerate these foods again, except for certain circumstances where there is like a medical condition, um, like celiac disease, where you're not going to be able to get gluten back. But most people are able to bring a variety of foods back once they identify an underlying cause for it. Got it. And most likely in moderation, of course, that you don't end up back where you started. Absolutely. Yes. Maintenance. It's, exactly. it's, it's kind of like I tell people, if you exercised and exercise helps you get to fitness goals or not just weight, like fitness goals, exactly. you don't reach that goal and you stop exercising, you maintain exactly. it. And so that's, that's healthy eating as well. Absolutely. And so if you, not to, you know, give any spoiler alerts, but are there some things that you have noticed or that you recommend in the book to avoid perhaps or include that the average person may not know or is not as commonly thought of when they people think about acid reflux? Do you have a little gem that you can share with us? Yeah, absolutely. I think most people know they should avoid tomatoes, orange juice, lemon, vinegars, and, and, and uh, coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't realize that onion and garlic can be uh, uh, triggers for acid reflux. So, And the problem is like across all cultures, whether it's really all over the world onions and garlic are hardest the thing hardest thing for people to eliminate because in every cuisine you start with onions and garlic so absolutely you i mean myself included like it's the base for majority of my meals i'm yeah. popping onions yeah, yeah. so part of what working with a dietitian helps or when you have a guide is that well guess what you can have the, the long onions, like the scallions or the green onions, you can eat the green part and still get the flavor. You can eat the green part of leeks. Uh, you can use ginger. You can use oregano, basil, thyme, sage. So there are alternatives that would bring flavor, but we just got to take those out for a couple of weeks, two to four weeks at least, and see how it goes. And, and they may make a, a big impact on your health and and that if you can sleep at night, if you're not in pain, then it may be worth it. And now you're looking for root causes, uh, but you know you may be able to bring it back. But the onions and garlic, I also suggest people try uh, also looking at foods that create gas and bloating in the abdomen. What happens with reflux is the stomach content is splashing up and that's the acid is in the esophagus, which is that tube connecting the mouth to the stomach, it, the esophagus is not made to handle the acid. So when we have too much pressure in the abdomen, imagine a balloon being blown inside your abdomen and it's pushing against the stomach. Uh, so that's going to be uh, creating the reflux. And so foods that create gas, such as lentils, legumes, which are also basic, also helpful, but we have to kind of remove those for a little bit. Uh, apples, pears, um, soy, milk, um, lactose containing dairy products, cauliflower, asparagus. So these are all healthy foods, but for some people for with acid reflux and if you have bloating and gas, which the topic we or something that we're going to talk about, um, it's, it is worth it to take those out temporarily to see if that makes a difference and then bring them back and I think it's really important to highlight this. You don't want to eliminate those foods long term because they do feed the good bacteria in the gut. But if they're feeding bacteria that are overgrown or grown in the wrong place, then that's part of a problem that needs to be resolved. 
Awesome. That's such important information. I love how you broke that down very clearly for us. It's very easy to understand and to, to the way you explained it. And so when, where can we find your book basically? Because it sounds like, I mean, if just from that brief little preview, we just learned so much. I'm sure the book has a lot to offer. So where can we get your book? Uh, Amazon is the best okay. way. So, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Complete acid reflux diet plan. Okay, perfect. So I think we, we definitely jumped in head first talking about acid reflux and nutrition. And, and, and so let's, let's pull back a little bit because I want to talk about specifically your, your background in functional and integrative nutrition. That is a mouthful. And for a lot of our viewers, they may have no idea what that means. And as I mentioned in my introduction, what we eat, you know, and food is our medicine. And a lot of the times we can really, like you said, with acid reflux, really resolve a lot of symptoms just by eating certain things and avoiding certain things in large amounts. And so um, let's talk about what functional and integrative nutrition is and why that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, my background, I started as, uh, I mean, I'm a registered dietitian. So in my training, uh, we did a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, I would say mainstream, like straightforward, um, training and that's the advice that that the nutrition that i learned a while back uh, maybe curriculums changed but but it wasn't um let's just say that i had a hard time when i started meeting when i started opening my practice and i started meeting my uh, digestive uh, patients patients with digestive issues is we really didn't have a good understanding of what causes these issues mm -hmm. and uh, how to help those people. And that's what got me into this world because, and I even tell people I had food sensitivities. I didn't know I had them. And I sort of, it started as a quest for myself to feel better because I was doing all the right things. I was eating all the healthy foods I'm supposed to eat based on the food guide pyramid and then the plate. I was exercising, mm -hmm. but then something wasn't right. And it was hard as a dietitian to feel like you can't figure it out and how are you going to help others if you can't figure it out for yourself that's and so that's how i got into this functional uh nutrition or functional medicine so the big institute for functional medicine is the institute for functional medicine and really what they look at you know as simple as possible is the body is a a, a group of systems that are connected and an imbalance in one system is going to have a trickle effect so our body is like a web or or arrows are going in multiple directions as opposed to considering the cardiovascular on its own and then hormones on their own and the digestive system a different they're all connected and if I may, like I give people an example, if somebody has an autoimmune uh, thyroid problem, Hashimoto's, where the immune system is attacking the thyroid gland, in a conventional uh, or a typical setting, the patient is going to go to an endocrinologist to, uh, you know, explain their symptoms and they'll run the labs and they're going to give them a medication, which is can really be helpful, but integrative and functional medicine is looking at what are the other systems that are connected to this uh, uh, condition. And so maybe the, the, there's a connection to the gut, to the immune system, maybe detoxification systems. And once we try to optimize all these systems, we do, uh, we help the patient feel better and feel optimal. And so nutrition is part of that functional medicine world where we're looking at certain foods to eat, certain foods to avoid, uh, nutrients to optimize, vitamins and minerals to support all these symptoms and systems. Wow. So, I mean, it sounds like it's a more comprehensive approach to any medical condition really is just including our digestive system as part of whatever symptom you might be having, including, as you said, in your, in, when I introduced you, looking at chronic pain, migraines, headaches, and it's crazy to think that there's a link to all of these things to our digestive health, but there is. And so I love that because I agree, everything is interconnected. And so, which is why as a family physician, when I'm um, treating, I always talk about other things that maybe not just, well, not just medication, but like, you know, how's your eating? What are you eating? What kinds of food? What quality foods? Are you exercising? How is your sleep? All of these things, you know, people think 
you know, it's unrelated, you know, I'm here for my foot or my knee, but really just like you said, our body is so connected in different ways that all of these other systems do play a part into something as simple as our headache. Right. So I love yeah, that. Absolutely. And the family physician in, in one way, like looking at everything, right? Mm -hmm. Like we need the specialist. We need the GI doctor to run the colonoscopy and the endoscopy and do the diagnosis. Yes. Uh, but where, uh, you know, as a family physician, you're connecting the dots. And as a dietitian, the, the people who find me are people who are already eating healthy. I actually find that mm -hmm. my patients are not eating junk food already. They're not drinking mm -hmm. soda. They're not having processed foods. They're doing all the right things but they still are not feeling good. They may be constipated or they may have diarrhea and, and go to the bathroom four or five times a day and cannot leave their house or something that would say, I feel like I look, I look I'm uh, five or six months pregnant by the end of the day, which is not normal. Like a little bit of bloating and gas after beans maybe is okay. <laughs> but every single day yeah. and it, the severity of it and to, to a point that it's disrupting your day-to-day -day activities okay. Then that's not that's not right. That's not normal. Absolutely, I, and I love that. I and I want us to come back to that to talk about some of these very common symptoms that you mentioned: bloating, pain, gas. And so we're going to jump into that next. We do have to take a quick break here, though. But we'll be back and we'll start talking about all of all of those things. <laughs> You're watching What's Up Doc on Muslim Network TV, and we'll be back after this short break. My wife, who uh, she's a professor at the University of Cincinnati, who, who's Catholic, and by her watching and listening to our three-year-old son uh, watch Adam's World, she ended up taking Kalima Shahada. She embraced Islam because she learned so much about Islam and the other prophets. It really affected our life in a great way, and because of uh, Sound Vision and Adam's World, we're Muslims. I took my Shahada 15 years ago, and I actually am from a rural part of Ohio, and so I found the catalog for Sound Vision, and I ordered the the tapes and the CDs and the books and I use those and especially for my little daughter you know that's how we basically learned our Islam and Islam entered our hearts through the wonderful works of, of Sound Vision. Okay, Assalamu alaikum brother I just want you to know that I love the Sound Vision website that a lot of times when I'm looking for information especially as it relates to homelessness domestic violence and women issues I go to that website and then I see what you've written and then I copy and paste it and spread the word because the wisdom is there so I can't you know, I can't do any better than what Sound Vision has already done. Sound Vision is our survival uh, uh, guide. It is the uh, organization that provides skills for Muslims how to survive and thrive in this uh, community here in the U.S. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Anam. I'm in 11th grade and I grew up with Adam's World and what it taught me was unity, respect and love for the Muslim Ummah. Is Adam's World is the greatest show ever made. Take me to the Kaaba, man. I love that puppet.
Welcome back to What's Up Doc on Muslim Network TV. I'm your host, Dr. Ali al Barwani, and today we are talking about good digestive health and what that means. Joining us in that discussion is Noor Zibde. Before the break, Noor, we were talking about just why, you know, well, we started off really jumping into it, talking about acid reflux, but then we also included why it's important to consider a functional and um, integrative nutrition and what that means. And so we've under we understand that it's essentially looking at multiple things, including nutrition when it comes to our, med um, our health, really. And so before the break, we were also talking about some very common symptoms that people experience that maybe include that things are not quite right. And that includes bloating, gassiness, constipation, diarrhea. I mean, those are the general symptoms that we think about when we think about specifically things going on with our stomach and our digestive health. So let's talk about that a little bit. I know it's you know a handful of different symptoms and they can all mean different things. But in your, in your experience, what are some common causes for this constellation, I guess, of symptoms? Yeah. Um, so if we are talking gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, sometimes people have these symptoms and have seeked an, an official diagnosis. And they may have been told they have irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. Uh, which is a very common condition that a lot of family physicians and uh, GI doctors uh, end up seeing. Now, um, it's and some people don't even have the diagnosis. It's a diagnosis of sort of elimination, meaning your doctor may feel like you meet certain criteria for the, the amount of pain, the frequency, how long you had it, or the symptoms. Uh, sometimes doctors would run a colonoscopy and, or endoscopy and say, they don't find anything and they'll tell you everything is normal. You probably have IBS. So I really want to say like sometimes people have the diagnosis. Sometimes they don't meet the criteria for the diagnosis, but they are still uncomfortable and in pain. So whether you have it or not, um, it's definitely, if it's disrupting your life, we got to do something about it. So some of the biggest triggers, uh, I, I do want to mention uh, a lot. Recently, the research is finding that IBS 60 to 80 percent of cases of irritable bowel are related to an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine. So a condition that is known as small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And really the to think about this is that uh, back, it doesn't necessarily mean bacteria is bad or it's an infectious or a pathogenic bacteria. It's just bacteria in the wrong place. If you have water in a glass, it's really good for you and you want to drink it. But if you pour that water in your purse and now it's getting into your uh, wallet and your stuff, then water or on the your wallet. laptop. <laughs> yeah. So it's in the wrong container. Yeah. That's because of bacteria. So if we have too much bacteria in the small intestine, the job of the small intestine is to digest and absorb. The colon, the large intestine, if you think of like the one going up transverse and down, that's where the majority of the bacteria is, which is beneficial for us. So if that bacteria starts to, uh, well, it's normal for the bacteria to be there. It just has to keep going. It, it shouldn't stay there. So if there are problems with the bacteria, making it all the way to the colon, then we start to have uh, problems or these a lot of these symptoms. So I kind of wanted to give this background. Now, what would cause the slow or backup? Sometimes we have the muscles in the small intestine, they need to contract, like kind of like a, a snake moving and push the food or anything that didn't get digested down downwards. So if there's a problem with this, whether it's a um, nerve issue or maybe stress related or maybe food poisoning. And, and a lot of times I wanna mention food poisoning because sometimes people feel like they did this to themselves and actually it's not. We, we wanna recommend healthy eating, but a lot of times it's something that was completely out of your uh, control. Like we, we, we don't go out seeking food poisoning, right? So, <laughs> so, so exactly. And so like there's sometimes some guilt associated. Oh, well, I ate sugar all my life. Well, once you have that problem, sugar is not your best friend, but sugar did not trigger it. So I just kind of want to clarify that. So if we have problems with the motility, then we have um, issues sometimes. And that's where the connecting the dots is people with thyroid problems. It slows down every cell in your body, including your digestive tract and motility. Mm -hmm. uh, people who we, we start to lose enzymes. Oh, so, so connecting that back to acid reflux. Mm -hmm. 
uh, long-term use of PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, can uh, um, prevent your stomach from making the acid, which may help and give you some relief. But that acid is really important to trigger the digestive juices to be released from the pancreas and from the bile and all of the digestive process. It's that domino effect. It's that first domino piece. Mm -hmm. And so when people and also, are- and sorry to interrupt, Noor, but also just with me talk about motility for our patients who are diabetic as well. And that because of that neuropathy, they have gastroparesis where their their intestine, just like you said, their motility is shut down and that can happen as well. I, I, absolutely. Like Again, like it, I have a long, a super cheesy. <laughs> no, I'm not the physician, so I'm not the one diagnosing it. But when I have somebody telling me there are these conditions that they have, yes. then it's all like a, 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 I'm going through a list in my mind, and I'm like, okay, we have a, something that's happening here. Uh, so, so you know, long term use of certain medications, especially like over the counter, when people don't really realize. Sometimes, like it, it, I, I, it breaks my heart that. A lot of times people are using over-the-counter medications, not realizing they're safe, they're not harmful, but the long-term effects are going to uh, create that that trigger that could, uh, you know, down the road, a few years down the road, cause problems. So we have some diet issues. Um, we have, um, we have um, you know, lifestyle stress. And, you know, it's it's important to, like, you know, we're not really like telling anybody to stop their medication. Uh, like PPIs are used for acid reflux. We're not saying they're going to improve motility, but we just know all the, the steps that support proper digestion. And so if we can address some of the root causes and, and really have a conversation with our uh, doctor on how to manage the medications or how to man manage like you said, diabetes, for example, then we have a better chance at improving digestion. And it goes vice versa because nutrients are the, the base and the foundation for making hormones and uh, activating pathways. And so we really want to digest and absorb the nutrients. And we, we want to digest and absorb the nutrients and so that they can support all the other systems. So again, that's how it goes in both directions. Exactly. I love that. And, and talking about nutrition and be, being able to absorb vitamins, something I see a lot is vitamin D deficiency. And a lot of people are like, well, I'm taking vitamin, you know, I'm drinking or I'm eating foods that are high in vitamin D. And, and so they're just so confused about it. But just like you said, you know, it's good that they're having it, but if they don't have the right um, basis to absorb that into their system. It's just going in and coming out. It's not being used in or absorbed in a way that's useful and meaningful for their bodies. So that's a great example, you know, great example of what you're just saying there with, with our, our gut being able to absorb adequately. Yeah, absolutely. I tell people, you know, you may have heard you are what you eat yes. and I tell them you are what you digest and absorb. <laughs> Exactly. And a lot of times people just keep asking, like people, one of the common questions, like what vitamins should I take? What, and, and, you know, we can go into different day, like, should you take vitamins or not? And, mm -hmm. and it's not really important, but if you're not digesting, it's just coming in and out and you're spending money, um, it, you know, like, and even like people who are conscious about their foods and you're making healthy foods at home and, you know, you're buying high quality foods. If you are not digesting and absorbing, unfortunately, your body's not going to benefit from it uh, the way we want it to benefit from it. Exactly. And because you did bring up um, bacterial overgrowth, I want us to just talk about what are some things that people should be thinking about or doing to help with that? You know, because as you said, it's it's important for the health of our digestive system and we want to have healthy digestive systems. So what are some recommendations that you have or what do you tell your patients? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So... You know, it's it's basic. Sometimes people are looking for the uh, big shiny thing, but it's <laughs> simple. Sit down and eat your food as calmly mm -hmm. as you can. Take 20 minutes to eat and chew your food thoroughly. I, I don't know how many people listening or watching, uh, they take few, they chew a couple times and then you swallow your food when it's still big and chunky. I so can tell you that you have at least one person listening and that is right here. I am terrible. I'm, I've been all my life and I've always, you know, try to be conscious about eating and chewing and, and making sure my food is a consistency of mush, but I am just, I 
it's just how I've always been. And it's something I have to consciously think about is to chew 20 times, you know, or whatever number of times so that I'm just like mentally being conscious of my chewing, but I swallow chunks and have to like, <laughs> almost sometimes like, you know, get some water because I'm like, oh, it's stuck in my throat. It's a terrible habit of mine. My parent, my family makes fun of me. Like we will all sit down to dinner and I'll be done in like five minutes because I do not do what, like you said, the basics to your food properly. Our digestion begins in our mouth. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, as I said, like people are always looking for what, what's like, the super food that I should eat. And there are definitely a lot of healthy foods, but you just got to sit down. And I, unfortunately, like culturally, like we're, we're getting those messages, like, what should I eat on the go? And uh, here's a quick snack. And, and, uh, you know, we've, we've got our work and we have our families and I'm a mom and sometimes mealtimes are very chaotic. I, I, I'm like, how did I just finish my food? And, and so I think like the advice, one advice is not going to work for everyone, but look at your work, your family life, where can you bring some calmness to your meals and uh, chew thoroughly? And you mentioned 20 times, which is great, but you know what? I tell people, you know what? Just chew, chew five times more than what you do now. And I think that's an improvement because 20 can seem like a little stressful or, or uh, overwhelming for some people. So just at least do five chews more. And, um, and another thing, so, so in, 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 and I think it's really important. I do want to highlight it is on the, while we want to sit down and eat, we don't want to eat all the time. We don't want to graze all the time because one of the things that are really important to make sure this small intestine cleans up. And so like the small intestine, like subhanAllah, like our body is built to function in an amazing way. The, the, the muscles contract to move food down, but then when we're done eating, the muscles contract to clean up. So we have a housekeeping motion in the intestine, but it gets interrupted every time we eat. And that motion needs about an hour and a half to three hours, uh, even four hours in some people. And so I do let, like to tell people like close the kitchen, like back in the days we had, you know, kitchen closed at a certain time. And so in between meals, give yourself three to four hours break so that you let your intestines clean up and prepare for the next meal and not have bacteria or waste or uh, fiber or anything that came into your food stay stuck in the small intestine. I love that. That's great advice. I most certainly can do five extra chews. I think 20 was killing me. So yeah, five extra chews, definitely something I can do. Yeah. And then um, also how amazing and beautiful that even in our sunnah to eat and drink, we are encouraged to sit down and not do it standing. So it's interesting that you're tying that in that that's recommended for better for better digestion, basically. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then like stress management, I, I know like we cannot control the world and control everything, but we can do our best in controlling how we react to it. And at least like if there's a, a you know, trying to not have the, those hard conversations when we're eating or maybe taking a few minutes before we eat to uh, take uh, to to deep uh, breathe, deep uh, deeply breathe, or making making a prayer or dua or like meditation or whatever that helps bring some calmness to your body because you need to get your in, in, in nervous system from fight or flight. It needs to go into rest and digest, which you know is so important for not just digestion for a lot of things. And so I think that's also important to. Um, try to, to, to slow things down and be prepared for the meal when the meal time comes. Such valuable information, Noor. I love, I love all of this. I mean, I, I should be taking notes, but I'll definitely be <laughs> keeping these in mind for when I have my next meal. So I want us to definitely talk about specifically when it comes to ir irritable bowel syndrome, because as you mentioned, sometimes these symptoms are so nebulous right like constipation diarrhea they are can be caused by a lot of different things but after evaluation by their you know patient gets evaluated by a physician maybe has had a colonoscopy nothing you know they're not finding anything and as you said we're treating it like irritable bowel syndrome we really just don't have an answer and it's a diagnosis of exclusion so i want us to get into specifically when it comes to ibs if there are things other than what we've already talked about that might help to relieve symptoms or some triggers that they that our audience can avoid. But before we do that, we do have to take a quick break and we'll come back and jump right into that. 
You're watching What's Up Doc on Muslim Network TV, and we'll be back after this short break. My name is Adam. You remember me. I appeared in so many episodes that Sound Vision has put on the market. No matter what it oh, no. Hey, what's happening? Hey, oh, sorry. Lockdown is what it is. Well, continuing here, in this lockdown, Sound Vision never stops thinking about you, the viewer. We'll have to get back into production again, online and in line. Everybody in their own space, e even me. Although I'm stuck with Lenisa. Salam! <laughs> Salam! Salam! <laughs> I, know, I know, you were shocked too. Well, l let me continue. Uh, this, is, um, this is what I was going to say. Salam! 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 Cut! 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 <sighs> Finally, I get my own screen time again. Thank God. And so we invested in new equipment to bring you even better production with new songs and new singers and animations. Well, here are a few clips. And Sound Vision has brought all this into your home, making Islamic values and teachings easy. And if you know me, Adam, a multi-talented actor, <laughs> well, sometimes I'm an actor and, and the reporter and the... Oh, that's enough. Let's move on to the next section. Well, you can watch these new episodes on our new app at www.adamsworldapp.com. We have previews happening every day on Muslim Network TV. Sound Vision has been serving generations, moving and changing with the times. We are all faithfully connected. That is a huge blessing. Your donation helps keep these programs available now and into the future. We take this job of helping tomorrow's Muslims today seriously, and you should too. Today, we need your help. Children absorb and learn from everything they encounter. Make that wholesome, positive, grounded in our faith, Together, we can accomplish our goal of raising better Muslims, better neighbors, and better citizens. Please donate generously. It's an investment in our future. But to finish, let me tell you there are new scripts on my new mission. And it is something that I enjoy talking about. My new mission is Space! Houston, we do not have a problem! <laughs> 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 
Salam, see you soon. Welcome back to What's Up Doc. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Barwani, and today we are talking about all things digestive health. Joining us in that discussion is Noor Zibdeh. And before the break, we were getting into irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. We kind of already talked about what it is, what are some of the symptoms. Let's move on now, Noor, to talk about some foods that trigger IBS, as well as some ideas or some ways that you manage your patients who have IBS. Absolutely. So <clears throat> a lot of the problem with IBS is that foods that create fermentation in the gut, they feed the bacteria and that are, uh, and, and that's the bacteria would produce gas that would cause the bloating and, uh, the diarrhea and the constipation uh, follow, or the constipation, sometimes both actually. So the foods that we want to avoid are there, some of them are really actually now on top of the processed foods, the, sh the high sugary foods, we, we want to avoid foods that feed the bacteria. So that sounds counterintuitive, but for somebody who is actually in pain and suffering, it's a way to calm down the, the issue. And so the important thing is to say, like, you eliminate those foods or remove them from your diet for a short period of time, but this is not your forever after diet. This is not uh, something you want to follow long-term because it can deprive the beneficial bacteria long-term. So the diet I like to recommend people and they can look it up. I have information and it's, it's pretty popular in, in my world, uh, the low FODMAPS diet. It's L-O-F-D-O-M, uh, the low FODMAPS diet. Um, and uh, it's like a low fermentable uh, load. And so we avoid things like onion and garlic. We avoid uh, fruits like apples, pears, watermelon, and uh, vegetables like cauliflower, asparagus, celery, uh, legumes, uh, wheat actually, and rye and barley, not because of the gluten, but because they have those fermentable fibers and lactose containing foods. So somebody who's listening, it's like, it's a lot of foods that you probably eat on a regular basis. But again, that's part of the 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 big picture it's 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 only a small part and we remove these foods to uh see if that helps with the symptoms and then we bring them back later so th these are the triggers that i want people to pay attention to awesome so for those who were listening to Noor's um just what she just said okay perfect i just wanted to make sure the banner came out <laughs> with that because that's a new term that we're introducing but it is a specific kind of diet just like you um, described that can help allevi alleviate some of the symptoms. And to be clear, Noor, we're talking about bacteria that normally, because people, when they think about having bacteria in their gut, they're very like fearful. They're like, oh my God, I have bacteria. Because when we think of bacteria, we think of bad bacteria, right? We think of infections. But in fact, we do have good bacteria that live on our skin, that live in our mouths, that live in our gut, you know, different parts of the body where we want this bacteria to be there. And it's important for them to be there. And so here we're talking about just essentially having a, a good balance of that healthy bacteria, correct? Yeah, and, and it's really, we wanna feed the bacteria in the large intestine because they help us uh, make certain nutrients that nourish the, the, the gut. I think the gut is, it's a big term, but really the small intestine and the large intestine are really two different parts and they function a lot differently. And so this beneficial bacteria is gonna help us extract nutrients from our food and make certain vitamins. and 
the bacteria is going to boost our immune, the beneficial one is going to help us boost the immune system and prevent overgrowth of yeast and parasites and just help support us. And so we need them and they need us. And it's a symbiotic relationship. It's a problem if we have inflammatory bacteria or they take advantage of uh, an unhealthy or an unbalanced or an unbalanced uh, uh, environment and they overpopulate or if we have the bacteria in the small intestine where they don't belong so absolutely we don't want to deprive the beneficial stuff exactly and I understand that you also have, in addition to the book that we talked about at the beginning, you also have a specific training program that you help patients who suffer with IBS to kind of walk them through how to feel better. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And so I, I have a clinic and I see my patients with individualized plans and I test for food sensitivities. But before we even go there, I, that's why I wanted, I'm, I'm glad you put up the low FODMAPs diet because anybody can do this. There's a lot of resources and I do have a training on my website that I walk people through my approach, the dietary approach to IBS and how to take it one step at a time. I think a lot of things, something that's really confusing is that a lot of healthy foods we regard as healthy and they are, they may not be healthy for that person, whether they are those fermentable foods or they may have uh, create individual food sensitivities. They trigger the immune system for that individual person, or maybe they have natural uh, chemicals. So there are natural chemicals in food in foods that may trigger symptoms. And so we really have to understand our bodies and pay attention to our bodies and and find out what's actually triggering us, what's making us feel good and be in tune. And sometimes it's, it's people can do this on their own and other times they do need the help. So if you feel like you can't do it, it's okay because it can be very complicated and that's why uh, you can start somewhere but then seek help if you're not able to get where you wanna go. Absolutely, that's so valuable and very true because like you said, even though resources are out there, sometimes you do need a little bit of hand-holding either because you don't have the time to do the, the research, right? Or, or, or if it's overwhelming because some of, sometimes it can be overwhelming as well. So I love that you're sharing that with us. And I love that you said sometimes foods that are supposed to or targeted or marketed or thought to be healthy may not be healthy for you. And so making sure that you're, again, listening to your body, that's something I also encourage here often is listen to your body. And if it's telling you, I don't like this food, then just because it's healthy doesn't mean that your body is going to perceive it that way. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's the information and the knowledge is, it's great that a lot of people are talking about health, but I, it kind of can get people in trouble because you think one way or one food works for someone and it should work for you. And then it can be frustrating if it doesn't, or there's a lot of information that can be conflicting or really like advice that could be harmful. And so that's why, you know, listen to your body and each person is walking with a different situation. The, the overall medical uh, and the nutrition background is really important in lifestyle. And so, so that's why like, don't feel that you have to do something that someone else is doing, uh, listen to your own body, absolutely. And before we wrap up, unfortunately, our, you know, again, I can talk about this for a long time. I love like talking about how important healthy eating is and the different ways that we can achieve that. But I do wanna make sure we talk about in general, and I know we just finished saying how listen to your body, but there are some foods that, that are thought to be helpful to our body certain um, spices or herbs or even supplements once we've kind of got some of the other basics down that you mentioned to make sure that we are able to absorb the goodness out of these foods. But are there some things that you recommend to your clients and to our viewers to try to include so that they are able to achieve good digestive health? Yeah, absolutely. So let's just say you don't really have a lot of the bloating or the IBS symptoms. I, I think vegetables are key and a variety of uh, vegetables with different color because color translates to antioxidants. Uh, it's okay to cook the food if you tolerate it better. So like think of your the broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, you've got a family here and then you've got your orange 
uh, like carrots and bell peppers and the sweet potatoes. And then you've got the mushroom and cauliflower, even though they're white, but they're really good white foods for you. And so like sometimes we got this image that, you know, avoid all white foods. Uh, just don't forget they're healthy ones. Uh, so, so we want vegetables. We want uh, antioxidants come from fruit as well. So I don't like to vilify any food unless we know for sure that's causing a problem for someone. Proteins, we need protein on a regular basis. And so we need healthy fats. We, you know, we prefer obviously lean proteins, avocado, nuts, seeds, oils, uh, like olive oil. So like this is really general advice. We want variety. And uh, you mentioned herbs and um you know, like we, so, so we want variety and unless we have a, a reason to, to eliminate something and herbs are really amazing because they are natural antimicrobial. So every cuisine has, the, these are the oregano, the rosemary, the thyme, sage, they actually act naturally to help keep the balance in check. And so we add them for flavor, but we also add them for benefit. Now, when it comes to supplements, I kind of avoid giving like, you know, specific supplements because I, you know, every person listening is different but um for example if you have constipation maybe discuss a magnesium uh citrate supplement because that magnesium deficiency can be one of the reasons people have constipation or um possibly like you know if you've taken a lot of antibiotics for uh, for reasons that were up, out of your control you needed them then maybe you can benefit from taking probiotic uh there are different kinds of probiotics and so uh, i can go into details as well too but uh, so some things are helpful to support the body i think these are these two things that i lean on a lot in my practice Awesome. And absolutely, you know, like you said, there is a lot of details when it goes into probiotics. And that's exactly what I was getting at. A lot of people want to take probiotics thinking that um, all pro probiotics are created equal. And as we know, that's not the case. Um, before we actually really, really this time wrap up, are there specific foods? Because I do believe that there's a lot of benefits in probiotics found naturally in certain foods. So can you recommend maybe certain kinds of foods that they could get that benefit from as well? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing that comes to mind is yogurt. And I think yogurt has live cultures. It's not therapeutic. So if you suspect you had a lot of antibiotic use, you have frequent yeast infections, and you think there may be an imbalance, definitely talk to a provider. But incorporating yogurt on a daily basis can be helpful. And uh, just avoid the sugary stuff. So try to get the plain, whether it's Greek yogurt or the traditional, like a soury, like kind of um, my background is Arab, so we use the sour yogurt, uh, but without the sugar. Another really amazing food is uh, fermented vegetables. And these are like the pickled stuff, but just make sure that it does not have vinegar because vinegar kills bacteria. So we want the naturally or like the fermented old school. So some people may have seen sauerkraut in the in the stores or they may have come across it. Uh, so you can ferment radish or carrots and you can do that with salt and water and that's it. So we don't want the vinegar. So these are like two things that come to mind when they do have beneficial bacteria. What feeds the beneficial bacteria that you already have is something we call prebiotic, which can be found in asparagus, in uh, underripe bananas, in uh, legumes, in the broccoli family, uh, things like celery, garlic, onion, whole grains. And so again, that's when I say, you initially, if you have some of these symptoms, you want to remove these foods temporarily until you figure out what the problem is, but eventually you want to bring those back. Awesome. Thank you so much, Noor. I just loved our conversation today. I think that we went over quite a bit of information and hopefully we were able to share a lot of, um, or you know, be able to share that with our viewers today. I just love that we were able to talk about so much. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise. And we wish you every success in your career, Noor. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun talking. Absolutely. Of course. And I mean, I, I feel like there's a part two coming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always uh, uh, open. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in another episode of What's Up Doc. You can watch this and all of our other episodes on our website at muslimnetwork.tv. I'm your host, Dr. Alia Barwani, and I'll see you next time on another episode of What's Up Doc.